Hi folks, this is uh, Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. And uh, hope everybody's okay. And um, we're looking at the deception of evolution. I've been working through a book called Evolution Cruncher, and I got up to about page 38, 48. Uh, they allow you to use the book and to publish and print and uh, use any of the information uh, to um, get uh, the information out to the public. And so I'm going to be reading uh, from that book. And uh, it's 965 pages of useful information. And um, so let us begin. Um, We'll start from 1949, uh, Chinese Communism, 1950, when the Communists took control of China in 1950, the first new text introduced into all the schools was neither Marx nor Leninist, but Darwinian. Chinese Communist leaders eagerly grasped evolutionary theory as a basic foundation of their ideology. The government established the paleontology, uh, pale ontological institute in Beijing with a large staff of paleontologists dedicated to proving evolution. Sir Julian X. S. Huxley, 1887 to 1975, grandson of Darwin's bulldog Thomas Huxley. Julian Huxley was the leading spokesman for evolution by natural selection in the mid-20th century. Upon being named the first Director General of UNESCO, he was able to make evolution the key stone of United Nations scientific policy. He saw it as an opportunity to extend evolutionary thinking to the nations of the world, and he made the most of it. Uh, Julian Huxley, UNESCO pamphlet. Pit down to school debunked in 1953. This piece of skull and separate jaw was the only clear evidence that man was descended from an ape like creature. In 1953, Kenneth Oakley, British Museum geologist, Joseph Weiner, Oxford University anthropologist, and Lee Gross, Clark Anatomy professor at Oxford, managed to get their hands on the pit down skull and jaw and proved it to be a total forgery. The newly developed fluorine test revealed the bones to be quite recent. Additional research showed the bones had been stained with brichromate to make them appear aged. Drillings into the bone produced shavings instead of ancient powder. The canine tooth was found to have been filled and stained. Weiner published a book about the pit down forgery in 1955. William L. Strauss, The Great Pit Down Hawk, Science, February 26, 1954. Robert Silverberg, Scientist. Distant Scandals, a book of Hoss, 1965. Amino acid synthesis in 1953, when Stanley Miller produced a, a few amino acids from chemicals and made a continuous small sparking apparatus. Newspaper headlines proclaimed, life has been created, but evolution has hit the truth. The experiment had disproved the possibility that evolution could occur. The amino acids were totally dead and the experiment only proved that synthetic production of them would result in equal amounts of, of left and right handed amino acids. Since only left handed ones exist in animals, accidental production could never produce a living creature. Al Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 274. Discovery of DNA. 1953, Rosalind Franklin took some special photographs which were used in 1953 by Francis Crick and James Watson without giving a credit. To develop the outstanding helix model of the DNA molecule, DNA has crushed the hopes of biological evolutionists, for it provides clear evidence that every species is locked into its own coding pattern. It would be impossible for one species to change into another since the gene network together so closely. It is a combination clock and it's shut tight. Only subspecies variations can occur. Varieties in plants and breeds in mm. animals. This is done through gene shuffling. A, I, uh, apparin, life, its nature, origin and development, 1961, page 31. Herbert P. Jockey, a calculation of probability, a spontaneous 
Biogenesis, Bioinformation Theory, Journal of Theoretical Biology, Volume 67, 1977, page 398. The odds of accidentally producing the correct DNA code in a species or changing into another viable species are mathematically impossible. This has repeatedly been established by J. Leslie, Cosmology Probability and the Need to Explain Life in Scientific America and Understanding, page, page 53, 64 and 65, E. Ambrose, Nature and Origin of the Biological World, 1982, page 1835. Five polls about evolution in 1954. The general public supports the teaching of creation in public schools, not just evolution, by a massive majority of 86% to 8. AP and NBC polls. Number two, a national poll of attorneys agreed 56% to 26%. And find dual instruction constitutional, dual instruction constitutional, 63% to 26%. The American Bar Association commissioned a poll. Number three, a major majority of university students at two secular colleges also agree 80% at Ohio State and 50% 56% at Oberlin. Two thirds of public school board members agree 67% to 25% American School Board Journal poll. A substantial minority of public school teachers favor creation of evolution. Houston Analytical Consulting Poll Source W. R. Bird, Origin of Species, Revisited, 1954, page 8. Kersville Research, 1956. After 15 years of careful research, Donovan A. Kerville, a Loma Linda University biochemist, published an important book, Exodus Problem and Its Ramifications. Kerville correlated an ancient Egyptian and Bible events and dates, providing us with one of the best ancient chronologies available. He showed that Metathethos king list overlapping in a major reduction in the duration of Egypt's dynastic history and placement of its first double ruler dynasty at around 2150 BC. This study, along with others reviewed in chapter 21, archaeological dating, showed that archaeological dating does indeed correlate closely with Bible history. Due to a lack of space as we neared publishing time, we had to omit most of this chapter, but it is on our website. Thompson's attack on Darwin. In 1956, W.R. Thompson, a leading evolutionary scientist, was asked to write the introduction to the 1956 reprint edition of Darwin's Origin of Species. In it, Thompson scathingly attacked Darwin's theories at every essential point as worthless. W.R. Thompson, introduction to Charles Darwin. Origin of Species, 1956 edition. Children's books. 1958, while evolutionists secretly recognize theory is falling through the floor to the gullible public, it is praised more and more as the scientifically proven answer to the mystery of life and matter. In 1958, The Wonderful Egg was published and immediately recommended by the American Association for the Advancement of Science as a worthwhile science guide for little children. Two major NEA affiliates, the American Council on Education and the Association for Childhood Education International, gave it their highest recommendation. The book tells about a mother dinosaur who laid a wonderful egg, which hatched into a baby bird, the first baby bird in the whole world, and a baby bird grew up with feathers, the first beautiful bird that ever sang a song high in the treetops of long, long ago, quoted H. Morris and G. Parker. What is Creation Science, page 148. Geoscience Research Institute in 1958. This creation organization, GRI, now located in Linda, California, was organized specifically to carry on research work in the area of creationism and produced educational materials for scientists and science teachers. Darwinian Centennial Celebration, 1959. As the year 1959 approached, evolutionists saw it was a splendid opportunity to ballyhoo the glories of evolution theory. As the 100th anniversary of Darwin's origin of the species approached, a flood of books and articles appeared. The largest between was held at the University of Chicago, where Julian Huxley gave the keynote address focusing his attention on a triumphant total repudiation of God. 
In the same year, two major books attacking evolutionary theory in great detail were released. The first was Gertrude Hamilf Rabb's Darwin and the Darwinian Revolution, holding a doctorate from the University of Chicago. Her book was a powerful expo on the havoc the theory has wrought on the modern world. The second in-death book was by Jackie's Bazoon, history professor and dean of graduate faculty at, uh, at Columbia University. His book, Darwin, Marx and Wagner, declared that evolutionary theory was directly responsible for European wars of 1870-1945. Biological sciences and curriculum in 1959, another significant event the year was the establishment of a standardized biological science curriculum study, BSCS, the public secondary schools. The stated objective was the teaching, here it is, of evolution, sex education and racial problems and the need for legalizing abortion. A. B. Groban, Biological Science and Inquiry into Life. BSCS quickly received a seven million grant from the National Science Foundation to develop this new series. Shortly afterwards, the second major textbook revealed Project Man, of course, of study was given seven million by the National Science Foundation. It was filled with humanism and morally objectionable interpretations of personal and social life. Revolt in France in the early 1960s. A large number of French biologists and taxonomists, species classification, classification experts, rebelled against the chains of the evolutionary creed and declared that they would continue their research but would no longer try to prove evolution, which they considered an impossible theory. Taxonomists who joined the revolt took the name Cladis Z. Linz Lidinsky, Should We Burn a Darwin in Science Digest, Volume 51, January 1961, page 61. Ooh, that is awesome information, that is. First quasar discovered in... 1962 telescopes and a mysterious object which was named 3C273, which had a spectrum that was unintelligible. This peculiar object radiated most strongly in the fringes of the visible spectrum. It was a total mystery until February 1963, when Jesse Schmidt recognized that the problem was that it had a rad radical 6% shift towards the red. If the speed theory of red shift promoted by evolutionists was correct, that meant the object was moving away from us at 16% of the speed of light and was a massive 3 billion light years from Earth. As more and apparently faster quasars were discovered, the situation kept worsening. Ultimately, their existence debunked the evolutionist speed theory of redshift, yet the redshift and background radiation were the only two evidences of an earlier Big Bang. For example, in 1977, a quasar was found which, according to the redshift theory, was moving faster, eight times faster than the speed of light. Of course, scientists know it impossible for anything to travel faster than the speed of light. George Abel, Exploration of the Universe, 1973, page 409, Time Life, Cosmic Mysteries, 1990, page 68 to 69, Sky and Telescope, 53, 1977, page 1702. Creation Research Society in 1963, this important creation research organization was founded by a doctor, doctoral scientist with the express purpose of conducting research into creation evolution topics and publishing regular reports on them. Its journal reports have been of high scientific caliber. Background Radiation 1965, using a sensitive radio astronomy telescope, A. A. Penzias and R. W. Wilson research at Bell Laboratories discovered low energy microwave radiation coming from outer space. Big Bang theorists immediately claimed that this proved the Big Bang. They said it was the last part of the explosion, but further research discovered that it came from every direction instead of only one, that it was the wrong temperature and that it was too even. Even discoveries in the 1990s have failed to show that this radiation is lumpy enough, their term, to produce stars and planets. Steady state the universe theory abandoned in 1965. Fred Hoyle abandoned his steady state theory entirely in a public announcement at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. He listed five scientific reasons why it was impossible 
Nature, October 9th, 1965, page 113. The Switzerland meeting, 1965. It was not until the 1960s that the neo-Darwinists, those who had given up on natural selection, believed that mutations were the mechanism of cross change, began fighting with one another in earnest. At this meeting of mathematicians and biologists, mathematical doubts were raised about the possibility of evolution having occurred. At the end of several hours of heated discussion, it was decided to hold another meeting the next year. That's amazing stuff. The Witzer Institute Symposium in 1966. A milestone meeting was the four-day Witzer Institute Symposium held in Philadelphia in April 1966. A number of mathematicians familiar with biological problems spoke and clearly refuted neo-Darwinism in several ways. And an important factor was that large computers were by this time able to work out immense, cal immense calculations, showing that evolution could not possibly occur even over a period of billions of years, given the complexity of DNA, protein, the cell, and enzymes and other factors. We will cite other examples here. Mary Eden of MIT explained that life could not begin by random selection. He noted that if randomness is removed, only design would remain, <coughs> and that required purpose piling by an intelligence. He showed that it was being possible for even a single order pair of genes to be produced by DNA mutations in the bacteria. <coughs> e. coli, which is a very little DNA with the 5 billion years in which to produce it, Eden then showed the mathematical impossibility of protein forming by chance. He also reported on his extensive investigations into genetic data on homoglobin red blood cells. Homoglobin has two chains called alpha and beta. A minimum of 120 mutations would be required to convert alpha to beta. At least 44, 34 of these changes required changeover was in two or three nuclear nucleotides, yet Eden pointed out if a single nucleotide changed the curse through mutation, the result ruins the blood and kills the organism. For more on the Worcester Institute, read the following book, Paul Moorhead and Martin Kaplan, Mathematical Challenges to the Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of Evolution, Worcester Institute, monograph number five, Antelope Spring Tracks in 1968, Trilobites are small marine creatures that are now extinct. Evolutionists tell us that trilobites are one of the most ancient creatures that have ever lived on planet Earth, and they lived millions of years before they were human beings. William J. Meister, sir, a, a non-Christian evolutionist, made a hobby of searching for trilobite fossils in the mountains of Utah. On June 1, 1968, he found a human footprint and trilobites in the same rock, and the footprint was stepping on some of the trilobites. The location was at Antelope springs in about 43 or 60 kilometers northwest of Delta, Utah. Then breaking off a large two inch thick piece of rock, he hit it on edge with a hammer and it fell open in his hands. To his great astonishment, he found on one side the footprint of a human being with trilobites right in the footprint itself. The other half of the rock slab showed an almost perfect mold of a footprint and fossils. Amazingly, the human was wearing a sandal. To make a long the story short, the find was confirmed when scientists came and found more sandal footprints. Meister was so stunned that he became a Christian. This was Cambrian strata, the lowest level of strata in the world, yet it had sandal human footprints. Hallelujah! That's tremendous, amazing. Discovery of trilobite fossils in shod footprints of humans in trilobite beds, a Cambrian formation, Antelope Springs, Utah in Why Not Creation, 1970, page 190. The Appalach Institute Symposium in 1969. A follow-up meeting of scientists was held and given the title Beyond Reductionism, but it only resulted in fruitless discussions by scientists who had carefully researched the problems with men who were desperately trying to defend the evolutionary theories against the ever-growing mountain of evidence to the contrary. First moon landing in 1969, by the 1950s, scientists were able to predict that if the moon was billions of years old, it would have a thick layer of dust many miles thick. This is due to the fact, as R.A. Leighton explained, the lunar surface is exposed to direct sunlight and strong ultraviolet light.
and extra rays from the sun gradually destroying the surface layers exposed rock, reducing them to dust at the rate of a few ten thousands of an inch per year. In five to ten billion years, this was produced twenty to six miles, thirty-two to ninety-seven kilometers of dust. Our Ray Layton, uh, Ly Lyleton quoted in our Weiss on Creation Evolution Controversy, page 175. Because of this, NASA first sent an unmanned lander which made the discovery that there is very little dust on the moon's surface. In spite of that, Neil Armstrong feared that he had an Edwin Mulder and might suffocate when they landed, but because of the moon is young, they had no problem. Landing on July 20th, 1969, they found an average of 3 to 4 inches of dust on its surface. That is the amount one would expect if the moon were about 6,000 to 8,000 years old at a rate of 1 inch every 10,000 years. In Isaac Asimov's first published article in 1958, he predicted that the first rocket to land on the moon would sink gloriously in the dust and everyone inside would perish. Article mentioned in Isaac Asimov, Asimov on science. And to 30 year retrospective 1989, uh, page 16 to 17. Born in Ventry in 1971, a complete listing of all the Australopithecine finds up to the end of 1961 was printed in a new book. This included all the African bones of our half ape, half human ancestors, Time Life, The Missing Link, Volume 2. Although 1,400 specimens are described, most are little more than scraps of a bone or isolated teeth. Not one complete skeleton of one individual exists. When parts of bones are found, they of course can be moved into various positions and be interpreted as belonging to different creatures with very different skull and jaw shape. To this day, there is no real evidence of any genuine non-human ancestor of ours. Chapter 13 explains why reputable scientists question or reject the various finds by anthropology. Matthews attacks Darwinianism. In 1971, by the later part of the 20th century, even though the ignorant public continued to be told that evolution was triumphant, proven success, it was difficult to find any scientist who would defend Darwinian theories before his peers. L. Harrison Matthews and others distinguished scientists was asked to write a new introduction to Darwin's Origin of the Species to replace Tonson's 1956 introduction which scathely, scathelessly attacked Darwinism. In his introduction, Matthew said that Tonson's attacks on da Darwin were unanswerable. Then Matthew proceeded to add more damaging facts. L. Harrison, Matthew's introduction to Charles Darwin, Origin of the Species, 1971 edition. The evolutionary, evolutionary theory must have run into our times when book publishers cannot find a reputable scientist who is appreciative either of its basic teeth or its founder. Nice Symposium, 1972. By the early 1970s, not only were biology evolutionists in turmoil, but cosmologists and astronomical evolutionists were also. <coughs> the Nice Symposium met in April 1972 to summarize what had been accomplished and to list what was still unknown. <coughs> the unanswered questions included just about every aspect of evolution in outer space. <coughs> See nice at the back index of a number of the questions. How did hydrogen clouds for, form themselves into stars? How did linear momentum from theorized Big Bang change itself into angular momentum <coughs> and begin circling? How did the planets and moons form? The entire list is mind-boggling. After all these years, the astronomers still do not have an answer to any of the basic evolutionary problems. Review of the Nice Symposium and e. R. E. Koffel and K. L. Segraves, The Creation Explanation, page, page 141 to 143. Institute of Creation Research, 1972, Henry Morris and Associates founded the Institute for Creation Research, ICR, this year. It has since become the leading anti-evolutionary organization in the world and is located in El Cajon, California. The Return of the Hopeful Monster in 1972. Stephen J. Gould, a highly respected paleontologist at Harvard. Niles Eldridge, the head 
uh, paleontologist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and Stephen M. Stanley of Johns Hopkins University led out in resuscitation Richard Goldschmidt's hopeful monster theory, demanded that a community of evolutionary scientists consider it as the only possible mechanism for transspecies change. Or it was first revived in a cautious science paper presented by Gold and Eldridge in 1972, punctuated equilibrium, an alternative to phyl uh, phyletic gradualism in 1972, but it was not until 1977 that an article by Gold brought it back to center stage, Return of the Hopeful Monsters in Natural History, June, July 1977. The increase in despondency amongst evolutionaries over their inability to use natural selection or mutation to provide even the slightest evidence of cross-species evolution eventually led a number of scientists in the 1980s to switch over to this astoundingly ridiculous concept that millions of beneficial mutations occur once every 50,000 years to two creatures, a male and a female, who are living near each other, thus producing a new species pair. Poll of citizens and parents in 1973, a survey of 1,346 homes found that 89% said creation should be taught in the public schools. In a separate poll in 1995, homes 84% said scientific evidence for creation should be presented along with evolution, a comparison of students studying two models in decades of creation, 1981, page 55 to 56. Dudley's, Dudley's radio date radio dating research in 1975, radio dating of the cemetery rocks based on uranium and thorium and other chains had been relied on heavily to provide the millions of years dates, but a broad variety of research data repeatedly demonstrated that these methods are extremely unreliable. Much more on this in chapter 6. Inaccurate dating methods. H. C. Dudley, one of these researchers, found that using pressure, temperature, and electric and magnetic fields, stressing molecular layers, he could change the decay rates of 14 different radioisotopes. The implications of this are astounding. The strata were laid down under great pressure, and samples would vary widely to temperature and other changes. Such discoveries, along with the fact that the dates never agreed with one another, greatly reduced the value of radio dating, radium, therium, and other rocks, H.C. Dudley, radioactivity re-examined in, chemi in Chemical and Engineering News, April 7, 1975, page 2. Leaky's footprints. In 1977, throughout the 20th century, human footprints have been found in supposedly ancient rocks, sometimes with dinosaur prints. We will mention only a couple examples in this chapter. In chapter 13, Ancient Man Farm for More. In approximately 1977, Mary Leakey found uh, L A T O L I in Africa, 30 miles, 40 kilometers south of Oldover, George. Human footprints, which by strata they are on, even evolutionists date at 4 million years in the past. Yet they are identical to modern human footprints. These and other footprints disprove evolutionary theory, especially those in which dinosaur prints are found with human footprints. Dinosaurs are said to be dated from 65 million to 135 million years ago, whereas man is said to have appeared far more recently. National Geographic, April 1976, Science News, February 9, 1980. Plagiosaur discovered in 1977, scientists have wondered for decades whether an extinct dinosaur would ever be found alive. Then in April 1977, a Japanese fishing vessel caught a 4,000 pound, 1,814 kilogram, 10 meter creature in its nets of the east coast of New Zealand. A qualified zo zoologist was on board and photographed and examined it carefully and confirmed that indeed it was a Plaiosaur, a sea-dwelling dinosaur which supposedly had been dead for 100 million years. They were so thrilled that they published scientific papers on it, issued a postage stamp, but recognizing that the creature would disprove their fossil strata theory, Western scientists said it must have been a sea lion. There was an almost total news blackout on this in the West, with the exception of a few publications, New York Times, July 24, 1977, 
Nature, July 28, 1977. There is more data on Chapter 12, Fossil and Strata. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Absolutely amazing. See how deceptive it all is. Absolutely deceptive. Couldn't believe. It. You can't believe. It. You couldn't make it up if you if you tried. I mean, absolutely devastating to evolution. All this information, and it's all documented. You can all go and check it and find out how these evolutionists cover it all up, throw it under the carpet where they've been exposed. And uh, did you hear that? A complete blackout. A complete and utter blackout of the Western media on that issue. Come on folks, you gotta wake up. Chinese characters explained in nineteen seventy six Chinese is one of the most ancient written languages in existence. Each Chinese character is a combination of several different words. C. H. Kang and Ethel R. Nelson did extensive research into Chinese words and discovered the characters contained the story of creation the Garden of Eden and the fall of Adam and Eve and the flood story. For example, the word boat is made up of two words, vessel and eight, Genesis 7-7, seven, seven, Genesis chapter 13-8 and 13. Tempter is devil, cover and tree, Genesis chapter 3-1-6. In chapter 14, effects of the flood will be found several more examples, plus an illustration of what some of them look like. C. H. Kang, Ethel R. Nelson, The Discovery of Genesis, How the Truths of Genesis Were Found Hidden in the Chinese Language, 1979. That's amazing. Poll of University Students, 1979. A poll of students at Bowling Green State University, Ohio, found a clear majority of both undergraduate and graduate students taking biology classes favored the teaching of both creation and evolution in schools. Undergraduate students, 91% graduate students, 71% uh, uh, and it says Jerry Bergman, Attitude of University Students Towards the Teaching of Creation and Evolution in the School's Origins, Volume 6, 1979, page 64 to 66. Notice, all these, uh, you know, these polls that have come up from 1953 to the 70s, many people saying they would like to hear the creationist viewpoint. But the intellectual elite and those who were in charge of education in America and uh, in the West made it quite clear that no, they were not going to allow any other particular position to be taught in schools. And yet, even academics, even students were saying, no, it's, we should have a, an open discussion. So the academic world in, in the West does not allow a fair enough uh, discussion within schools and colleges and universities about any information that might critique evolution. Polystrate mystery solved. In 1980, upright polystrate tree trunks in 10 to 30 feet, 31 to 95 dm in length, have often been found in coal beds, yet the coal beds were supposed to have been laid down over millions of years. Why are vertical tree trunks in them? Just after the St. Ellen's explosion in May 1980, analysis of near Spirit Lake. Uh, revealed many vertical floating tree trunks in it. During the flood, such tree trunks would easily have quickly been su um, surrounded by sediment and buried. Edward L. Hold upright trunks of neo calamites form in the upper uh, Tracic. Journal of Geology 55 from 511 to 513, 1947. Stephen A. Oostin of Mount St. Helens and Catastrophism in Impact July 1986 page 13. Next, Sunderland interviews the experts 1980 to 1981. Over a one-year period and with their permission, Luther Sunderland tape recorded interviews with three of the most important paleontologists in the world who are in charge of at least 50 percent of the major fossil collections on the planet, covering every basic fossil discovery in the past 150 years. He found that not one of them could name a single missing link a halfway species between our regular species, L.D. Sunderland, Darwin's Enigma, page 89. There are no transitional forms. For more on this, see chapter 12, Fossils and Strata. Chicago Evolution Conference, 1980. While the newspapers, popular magazines, and school textbooks emblazoned, the emblazoned evolutionary theory as being essentially proven scientifically in so many ways, the evolutionary scientists 
were discouraged. They knew the truth. The Switzerland, Worcester and Abilac meetings had clearly shown that theirs was a losing cause. However, in yet another futile effort in October 1980, 160 of the world's leading evolutionary scientists met again, this time at the University of Chicago. In brief, it was a verbal explosion. Facts supposing evolution were presented and angry and insults were hurled in return. The following month, Newsweek, November 3, 1980, reported that a large majority of evolution at the conferences agreed that not even the neo-Darwinian mechanism of mutation working with natural selection could no longer be regarded as scientifically valid or tenable. Neither the origin nor the diversity of living creatures could be explained by evolutionary theory. I can't believe this. This is, this is just crazy. I, this is why, as evolutionists, and those who believe in evolution, why you can't see that this is all a bunch of lies. You even had... You had... In the Chicago meeting, you had hundreds of even. You had how many was it? You had hundred. You had. I, I just can't. I believe it. One hundred and sixty of the world's leading evolutionary thinkers, uh, who were leading evolutionary scientists, make a statement. A large majority of evolutionists at the conference agree that not even the neo-Darwinian mechanism of mutations working with natural selection could no longer be regarded as scientifically valid or tenable. Neither the origin nor diversity of living creatures could be explained by evolutionary theory. Roger Lewin, Evolutionary Theory Under Fire in Science, November 21st, 1980. J.R. Taylor, Great Evolutionary Mystery, 1983, page 55. Why is the public still told that evolution is essentially proven and all the scientists believe it when both claims are far from the truth? New York City Evolution Conference, 1981. The following year, another important meeting was one at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Colin Patterson, a senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History, read a paper in which he declared that evolution was possibly anti-knowledge and added, all my life I have been duped into taking evolution as revealed truth. Yet Patterson is in charge of millions of fossil samples and he is well acquainted with the collection. Commentating on the crisis, another scientist, Michael Roos, wrote that the increasing number of critics, including many with the highest intellectual credentials, Michael Roos, Darwin Theory and Exercise in Science, in the New Scientist, June 25th, 1981, page 828. Whew, my friends, it's very, 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 very devastating stuff, this, my friends. Pans Permia, 1981. Amid the series of desperation and despair rising from evolutionary scientists, one of the most famous scientists of the 20th century, a Nobel Prize winner, came up with a new theory in 1981. Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of the DNA molecule, published a book declaring that directed panspermia was responsible for life on Earth. According to this theory, people from another planet sent a rocket down with the living creatures on it. In order to populate our planet, Crick admits that this does not explain how nearly all our plant and animal species came into existence. Nor does it explain the transportation problem. Centuries of travel through the cord of outer space would be required. This theory is desperate, grasping effort to provide a solution to the question of how living creatures originated, a puzzle which thousands of scientists in 150 years of diligent work have not been able to solve. Very few intellectuals have accepted panspermia. My friends, panspermia is a desperate attempt my friends come on when you start pumping out that kind of nonsense it means it's all over for evolution you would agree would you agree I'm sure you would agree it's absolutely desperate that you would come up with that kind of nonsense absolute desperation panspermia Woo 
Crazy days for the evolutionist. Crazy days. Cambridge Evolution Conference in 1984, desperate for a solution. In 1984, a seminar held at Cambridge University, Stephen Gould's hopeful monster theory was discussed. The wild idea that a lizard laid an egg one day and a bird hatched. Karl Popper's theory of science was also discussed. Popper is an expert on the philosophy of science. His position is that a theory must be testable. Evolution, of course, does not meet the test. See chapter 37, Philosophy of History, on our website. Yeah, just a little bit of an interest. Show me how natural selection and mutation that produces new species. Show me. Show me, show me, show me, show me. By a test, by a test, that this is the case. The mechanism is the case. Show me. If you can't test it, uh, then you can't believe it, if you know what I mean. And our second mechanism change over in 1980s, the utterly unscientifically hopeless monster theory which Richard Goldschmidt proposed in the 1930s. Hey, I tell you what you evolutionists can do. You could put your monster theory and your panspermia theory and have a pans monster theory uh, to come up with how life came on the uh, on the uh, on the earth. Oh, come on, my friends, it's just desperate. Yet as the years passed and a great mountain of evidence surfaced against both natural selection and mutations as a mechanism across species change, the experts felt desperate. There was nothing left but the theory of sudden, miraculous million, million mutation, beneficial changes once every 50,000 years, which Gold Stanley and their associates were increasingly urging. Just as astronomers had in desperation accepted the ridiculous Big Bang explosion theory 20 years before, as the cause of a universe of orderly galactic systems, so the biological evolutionists now went farther out on their own evolutionary limb. Geneticists, biologists, and paleontologists recognized that the evolution of one species out of another was impossible, otherwise, evolution is in hopeless separation, fled to an imagined hopeful monster. Answers in Genesis in 1980 started answers in Genesis a create evolutionist creationist organization now located in Florida Kentucky it has rapidly become a powerful voice in unveiling evolutionary errors in meeting on college and university campus and elsewhere for every one creationist organization now in operation there ought to be a hundred why not start one yourself why not start one yourself Halton C R Eliminated. In 1983, a leading astronomer and president of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in the early 1980s, ARP, carried on research for over 30 years, including extensive research time at Polymer and Mount Wilson observatories. He studied over 260 galaxies in more than 80 groups and tabulated 24 main galaxies and 38 discordant redshift companions, plus much more. His studies clearly refuted the speed theory of redshift which, with background radiation was the crutch that evolutionists leaned on to defend the Big Bang. Halton Arp, Quasar's Redshift and Controversies in 1987, page 5, plus many scientific articles, threatened with disembarment from U.S. observatories if he did not stop tearing down one of the two Big Bang pillars he refused. A few eminent astronomers, including the renowned astrophysicist Jeffrey Burbridge, made impassioned pleas for everyone to keep an open mind, but to no avail. In 1983, Caltech's Telescope Allocation Committee decided that ARP's line of research was not worthy of support, and he was to receive no more time for his work at the telescopes of Mount Wilson and Polymer Observatories. Refusing to switch over to politically acceptable studies, he left Caltech for a position in the Max Planck Institute of Munich, where he continued to pursue his ideas, referring to abrupt and ignoble ouster. Burbage later wrote, no responsible scientist I know, including many astronomers who were strongly opposed to Arp's thesis, believes justice was served. Time, Life, Cosmic Mysteries, 1990, page 67, 68. I mean, that's just absolutely... That is just absolutely indicting of evolutionary thinking because anything, any scholar, I mean, this was a guy of tremendous eminence in the scientific world, and because his ideas were upsetting their ideas, 
of the Big Bang, then we've got to get rid of him. Um, it's just absolutely shocking, and um, you should be ashamed of yourself to be following evolution when when you've been doing the uh, stopping uh, research and academic work by eminent scientists like that. Oracle Man debunked. 1984th news at last one of our half ape ancestors have been found in the Adjuliacia region of Spain. Certified as the oldest man in Europe by a distinguished team of paleontologists, it made the headlines an investigation were mailed to scientists throughout the continent to attend a meeting where they could deliver learned papers about the matter. But then, <clears throat> sorry, but then the scientists in Paris discovered that it was a skull fragment of a four month old donkey. Yes, a four-month-old donkey. Mm -mm. Spanish officials had to quickly mail 500 letters, cancelling the meeting, as taken from a man. London Daily Telegraph, May 14th, 1984. Dear, dear me, uh, evolutionist, it's not looking good for you today, is it? And I suspect you'll be all doing your little spinning like you always do in the next few days and weeks ahead, spinning and saying, well, we've got to get rid of that J because he's producing all this material, showing how we're, our beliefs aren't true and all the rest of it. Oh, J, how do you define species? You don't even know what species is, Jason. That's the kind of nonsense kind of arguments that these evolutionists that I've met uh, come up with. Look. Define your terms. Let We'll let you define the terms. But at the end of the day, my friend, we don't look at donkeys and say that a man and then try and get hundreds of scientists to come and discover the new half man and half ape and then find when it's all said and done. It's a donkey. I mean, come on. That was in 1984. As taken for a man, London Daily Telegraph, May 14th, 1984, atheist and evolutionist. Archaeatrix debunked in 1985, although no cross species missing links, half of one species and half another had ever been found. Something close to it had been discovered. As mentioned earlier, in 1861, a fossilized feather was found in the limestone deposits of Solenhofen, Germany, and the near Eiskat. It was considered valuable since it reportedly came from the late Jurassic strata and there were not supposed to be any birds back then. Soon another fossil was offered for sale, always from owners of the same quarry. It was a bird with feathers, with a head and neck missing. The British Museum paid a lot for it, so in 1877 another bird was, with feathers was offered for sale and this one looked like it might have the head of a small dinosaur. In 1985, six leading scientists, including Fred Hoyle, examined the fossil and found it to be a hoax. For details, so you'll see Chapter 17 of the Evolution Showcase. Arkansas Creation Trial, 1981. In December 1981, at the Federal District Court in Little Rock, Arkansas, Judge William Overton presided over in quotes, a trial to decide whether the state of Arkansas could place concepts about creation in public school textbooks. The courtroom of 200 was packed with reporters. The ACLU had over 50 lawyers and working on the case. In contrast, the Arkansas Attorney General Office could only commit three of its attorneys to the case. Francesco J. Alaya testified that the origin of living creatures from dirt and water, though it occurred, was not part of evolution, but nicely took the evolutionary puzzle out of the court trial. At any rate, on the basis of a variety of dodges and misstatements by the plaintiffs, the judge against Arkansas State. It is an old fact that the ACULU has devised every state advised every state legislature consider enactment of a law permitting equal time for both views that the ACLU will give them another full-blown monkey trial as they did at Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. The evolutionists never defend their position with scientific facts, for they do not have any. Instead, they use ridicule and lawsuits, Norman Geisler, the cre creator and the courtroom. 
1982, Robert Gentry's Creation Tinny Mystery, 1986. Yeah, it's interesting that this is one of the bullying tactics that evolution used, taking uh, states, taking councils, taking schools, colleges to court if any evidence mm -hmm. is presented against evolution. Uh, so basically, you're not in a free academic environment that's going on. Radioactive halos disproved molten earth theory. 1986, Robert V. Gentry carried on research into radio, radio halos in granite for years, but was discharged from Oak Ridge Research Laboratory in 1982 because he testified in defense of Arkansas State at the above-mentioned trial. He then put his years of research finding and professional articles into a book, Creation's Tiny Mystery in 1986. In brief, billions upon billions of platon, pl polonium-218 uh, radio halos are in granite, yet each halo was formed in less than three minutes. There is no way the halos could get in there after the granite was formed, yet the granite had to be solid when the halos formed. This means the granite was created solid in less than three minutes. Since granite is the basement rock under every continent, it would be impossible for the Earth to have been a molten mass, as conjectured by the evolutionists. Interestingly enough, granite can be melted, but it will reform into rhyolite, never into granite. See Chapter 3, Origin of the Earth, for a brief summary of data on this. Go to our website for a complete study on the subject. Poll of biology teachers in 1988, a survey conducted by the University of Texas founded that, found that 30% of 400 high school biology teachers believe in biblical creation and only 19% believe in evolution. Waco Tribune, Waco Tribune, Herald, September 11th, 1988. Chernobyl, 1986, is, another, is an evolutionary paradise. Since mutations are today thought to be the leading mechanism for achieving evolutionary change for the better, the intense radiation which the people received from 26, 1986 should have brought them great benefit because of all the mutations it induced. They should be stronger, healthier, have improved organs and produced children, which are higher forms of life. But this has not happened. Scientists know that even Marie Curie and her daughter died as a result of working with radiation. Mutations result in harm and death, never in evolutionary change. Isaac Asimov, Asimov's New Guide to Science, 1984, page 691 to 692. Here are some quotes. I have often thought how little I should like to have to prove organic evolution in a court of law. Errol White, Proceedings of the Lenian Society, London, 1966. An ichthyologist expert on fish in 1988 addressed before a meeting of the Lenian Society in London. Here's another quote. I doubt if there is any single individual with the scientific community who can cope with a full range of creation arguments without the help of an army of consultants in special fields. David M. Rupp, Geology and Creation, Bulletin of the Field and Museum of Natural History, 50, Volume 54, March 1983, page 18. Next thing, evolution could not do this. So I hope you're all sitting pretty. Uh, this has been uh, a revelation, and um, I hope that you're okay today. And we're going to continue this, and uh, as you can see, it's full of interesting information. So we're going to have just a few more now. We've gone on for nearly an hour, or maybe longer than an hour, and. Um, this is uh, the second part in the series. We've done um, evolutionary exposed, and we did a full over a full hour there. And uh, this is uh, the deception evolution, and there'll be three or four of these over the next few weeks, uh, more in depth. And I hope you can see that 
when we look at this in depth and we consider evolution like this, that there's some shocking, absolute shocking facts that the atheist will not tell you, the evolutionist will not tell you, and it's quite devastating to their position. What they want to do is just bog you down with technicalities, but when we actually look into it, it actually doesn't bear, basically the, the, the brow beating you with, with, with authority, scientific authority, but without the actual evidence. That's what they're doing. But when you scratch below the surface, um, when you scratch before the surface, you find that these uh, things are very, very poor. Um, so what I'm going to do now, um, uh, I need to get a glass of water um, because my throat is tired. And um, I'll see if I can... Uh, So what we'll do is, I'll just play you uh, a clip. I'm just going to uh, put a clip on for you. Um, uh, they give you permission. They, they allow you to use the material. And it's Slaves for Christ. And uh, it is. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Uh, so this is me, hope you're okay. I am now going to just put something on for you to watch just for a minute while I, I just go have a break, get some water. It's frightening what I have seen over the years. I, um, I hire teachers and I, I, they have to have at least a four year college degree. I prefer a credential. And these students that are college kids coming out of universities, whether they were secular universities or Christian universities, I was absolutely stunned at what they didn't know. And I was sickened by what they did know. And so that was one of the reasons that I felt that it was time to come out and just be able to present an alternative. I'm not here tonight to prove or disprove anything. That's not my job. God doesn't need me to prove his word, does he? But the problem is we tend to look at God's word in our own little world and we bring God down to our size. And that was what I did. As a scientist, it was really difficult to deal with Genesis. So what I want to do to start off with is just kind of give you a little update on who I am, where I came from, how did I end up here? Why, why would you come to hear what I have to say? I had a gentleman tell me earlier that evolutionary biologists aren't real popular. They, there, there aren't many of us. But there's, how many of you have ever heard of an exobiologist? Or an astrobiologist? You know, those exobiologists, someone that is the study of biology Elsewhere, I always thought that was a kind of a neat title in a description. So how do you study life in the universe? Well, you, you, spec, you speculate. So what I want to do is just give you a little rundown. And it, it started for me in 1958 when I moved from the hills of Wofford, Kentucky, right straight to Newport Beach, California. 
I can really tell you about culture shock. And we look like the Beverly Hillbillies when we come rolling out of Kentucky. Now, Wofford had about 400 population. Uh, it's about 399 today. And we piled everything we had on this old 1954 Ford station wagon, and away we went. I was wearing Oshkosh before they were cool. Well, I got to tell you, kids can be merciless. But I wanted to start right here, Timothy 6, 20, 21. It says, O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning their faith. What I find that scientists have a way of complicating everything. As a scientist, I can complicate a bologna sandwich. But the rule, that if you are a scientist or are in the science, you're going to hear, you're going to hear a, a rule. It's called Occam's razor. Occam's razor means keep it simple. I remember my first semester in college, I took a class that said, just listen to this for five minutes and then we'll get back onto some more information. And then I'm going to be doing a, a video completely different on a historical topic. Uh, we'll be reading out some information on a, on a historical topic. Um, we'll be also... Uh, recording uh, in the morning uh, we'll be doing some sermons um, and various things like that if you want to come and listen in the morning and in the afternoon on Sunday and uh, so that's what's going to be happening here and uh, this video is called Evolution of an Evolutionist by Dr. Rick Oliver and it's on Slave for Christ. They allow you to use their material. They're really good folk. Uh, go down there. You'll find tons of information. Slaves for Christ. Uh, loads of information debunking evolution. And uh, we'll just listen to this for a few minutes and then get back to our fact-finding information. Come on, the KISS principle. Oh, well, I, I don't sound pretty cool to me. But when I walked in, he had K-I-S-S. -S, keep it simple, stupid. That was the key. Now this is kind of a sad, but also kind of a humorous thing. When I read, first time I read this in the New York Times, I thought, that's, now that's sad. How can a man sit dead at his desk for five days and nobody notice? Well, you know what? It dawned on me. I've been going and speaking to some churches, and I've seen people sitting dead in the pew for years. We have to put our faith in this book. We have to put our own nose in this book. Let me read this for you and just see how interesting. It says, bosses of a publishing firm are trying to work out why no one noticed that their employees had been sitting dead at his desk for five days before anyone asked if he was feeling okay. George Tuckelbaum, 51, had been employed as a proofreader at a New York firm for 30 years, had a heart attack in the open plan office he shared with 23 other workers. He quietly passed away on Monday, but nobody noticed until Saturday morning when an office cleaner asked why he was working during the weekend. His boss, Elliot Wachowski, said, George was always the first one in dying each morning and the last to leave at night, so no one found it unusual that he was in the same position all that time and he didn't say anything. He was always absorbed in his work and kept much to himself. Well, I guess. But here, here's where it gets interesting. A post-mortem examination revealed that he had been dead for five days after suffering a coronary. George was proofreading manuscripts of medical textbooks when he died. I wonder if he's reading on the heart problems. <laughs> it says, you may want to give your co-workers the nudge occasionally. The moral of the story, don't work too hard. Nobody notices anyway. But isn't that sad? That a man can sit dead in his desk for five days and no one knows. What kind of impact did this man have on his colleagues, his peers, his family? 
So what kind of impact are you having? What kind of impact are you having on your neighbors, on your friends, your kids? See, we need to have an impact. Because, guys, I want to tell you, I am here tonight not because of some great textbook or some TV evangelist or anything else. I'm here for only one reason, and that's my mother and my grandmother never stopped praying for me. Everybody else kissed me on. And I'll tell you, I could avoid the Christians, and I did. And here's the hard part. It's when I was teaching, I taught high school for years, and then, then at the college level. I would give lower grades to some of my students just because I didn't like them, or they were Christians. So when I did accept Christ, I had this massive guilt problem to deal with. My mom or anybody in my family, would they would send me birthday cards or, or Christmas cards. I could hold them up to the light and I could look and see a check or a gift certificate in there. I would throw it in the trash without opening it. Because I knew if I opened it, it would just say, praise the Lord, Jesus loves you. Some of that religious stuff. That's how hardened I was. Because I was so hardened that I was not an atheist. I was an anti-Christian. I hunted them down. I loved to embarrass or humiliate a student who dared to challenge me in my classroom. But i got to tell you something. All the years I was teaching, and I had a lot of students challenge me, and a lot of times I just perceived that challenge when in fact it was just a, a honest, simple question. But one thing I noticed is that I never witnessed one of my Christian students ever take a stand. See, they... They would never take a stand for God's word over man's word. See, I would never allow their God into my science, but they always allowed my science into their God. And if they did that, I had them. And that's one of the things I want to talk to you about in these next few sessions. How we tend to bring God down to our size, who got in this, this box. You know, how, how arrogant that we would think that as a finite being, we can bring an infinite being down and understand. You know, God says, right, in his own words, there are just some things he knows that we don't. You know, people say, well, you know, as a scientist, this is not a textbook. No, it's not a science textbook, but I've got to tell you something. Every place this book touches on science is, is absolutely correct. This is the only book that has not changed. If some of the books I used as a student and then some of the books I made my students read are no longer valid. They're, they're obsolete. Not this one. I always like to start in this area here. But we need to understand that God's word is the true word. And we've got to be careful when we start messing with God's word. He tells us if we add to or take away from, there's problems. So you've got to understand that the deception is really subtle. See, Satan doesn't run around in a little red suit with a pitchfork and you know a cartoon character. But yet a lot of people put him in that position. We either give him too much credit or not enough. I love this, Matthew 24, 4. Jesus was talking to his disciples. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Simple, straightforward, absolute fact. Will God deceive you? No. But I guarantee you, men will deceive you. So the best way to understand or know what is true and what is just wild speculation is to check it yourself. You go to the author of the book, Matt, Acts 17.11. These billions were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched 
the scriptures daily. Did you catch that? See, they didn't search the textbooks daily or the science journals. No, you search scripture to find out the truth. And guys, that's hard. I, I cannot believe how many times I saw these, these wonderful, brilliant students when they were pressed, they would top out for man's word over God's word every time. And i got to tell you, there's just two choices. You don't have to make a, a list over here and a list over here and all of these things. No, there's just two. God's word or man's word. Where do you want to put your faith? And that's what it's built on. You know, it's okay for you to have a different opinion than I do. It's okay for us to have different opinions. That's perfectly legitimate. But what is not fair is for me to inflict my opinion on you as fact. And see, that's what's happening to the students. They are being force-fed. Students are being taught what to think, not how to think. And that is so destructive. We're talking here, folks, about two religions. Because that's what they are. And see, I hear people say, well, you know, we shouldn't even use that word, evolution. You know, I had a lady sitting in the front row at Mount Hermon Conference Center. It's a huge conference center. It's been there since 1906. And it's a very solid Bible-based camp, where it was. But let me tell you, this little old lady sitting in that front row, I start talking, and after a few minutes, you know, she's sitting there, she had this cane, and she's leaning on it, and she just jumps up and comes right up to me. And I'm thinking, she's going to hit me with that stick, what? And she says, you're new here, ain't you, young man? Well, that tells you how old she was. She called me young man. And I said, yes, ma'am, I, I am. I'm real, relatively new here. She says, you know this is a Christian camp? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I do. That's why I'm here. She said, you shouldn't use that word. You used that word evolution 26 times. So she was sitting there counting how many times I used the word evolution. She never heard a thing I said. You know, evolution is not a dirty word, folks. Evolution just means change. That's why the title of my talk tonight is The Evolution of an Evolutionist. Pretty cool, huh? See, I have evolved into the creationist I am today. See, that just means I've changed. But let me tell you, my PhD tells people that I am a professional evolutionary biologist. So I believe in evolution. I know it works. I have made it work. See, I can mess with the genes of a dog, and I can get yellow labs, chocolate labs, black labs, but I can't get a cat. See, change within us, because that's no problem. We adapt, we change. I can go in and talk in places. I was in, I've been invited into a few secular colleges, and uh, I was invited to speak at this uh, arena. There were 17,000 people. Guys, that's frightening. It's a sea of faces. It's not even fun because you can't even re relate with anyone. But when I walk in there and I were to hold up my Scientific American, or in this case, the very latest issue of New Scientist, I get a nice ovation here. But look what it says. Scientific American says authority expertise, credibility. So by using that, I gained that. I had credibility. I had authority. Why? Who wrote the book? See, if I were to go in there and do this, they would think... Okay, you can go and watch the full video, Evolution of an Evolutionist, Dr. Rick Oliver. And you can go and watch the full video uh, for yourself and so we're back on uh, the fact-finding information 
and uh, I've just been reviewing comments. Uh, here's a few comments from people under the uh, Gospel for You. This is a, a few comments. Uh, we'll just read a few, what uh, a couple of the people are saying here. Uh, that is true. Fundamentalist Christians don't confuse donkeys with men. However, they do think their donkeys can talk. Uh, oh dear, there's a painful look. Lack of understanding here. Yes, it is pitiful. These are just ad hominem attacks. Radioactive halos, good grief, it's pronounced halos. See, ad hominem attacks. Uh, it's all pure ad hominem attacks from the atheist. Even Ken Ham wouldn't use these kind of arguments, etc., etc. It's just ad hominem, ad hominem attacks. That's all the atheist can do. Uh, and it's the atheist just uh, saying all sorts of things against me um, because they can't win any arguments in academic debate against me so they try to get me off YouTube but that's another topic uh, and we're not going to let them spoil the evening we've had a wonderful evening and uh, a brilliant intellectual stimulation and we're not going to let them spoil that brilliant intellectual stimulation for all the research that we've been looking at in this video uh, which has been documented information that you can go and check and maybe some of the references are wrong mate let's say uh, in this reading that I've done let's say uh, 30 percent of the information is wrong even if 30 percent of the information that was wrong if just 70% of the information that I've been reading it is correct, it's devastating for evolution. But I think most of this guy's information will be correct because he, he references uh, the magazines, the newspapers and whatever, the books, the scholars. And uh, when the atheists begin to realize that I'm making videos uh, on this issue, they'll start pulling it to pieces and whatever. But I would say don't listen to them, don't listen to me, read the book and then go and research information yourself, go and check it out yourself, go and have a look yourself. The atheist and the evolutionist are masters of deception, they are masters of deception and they will try to deceive you and uh, they claim to be people of science but I'm an outlaw on YouTube. Uh, they don't want me on YouTube to produce scholarly videos on theology and philosophy, which is my field, and historical studies, which is my field. The atheists can't stand me being on YouTube because I can produce this kind of material, but they don't want that. And they don't want any information to get out there which will expose them. They won't have any academic debates with me. Um, I've tried to get academic debates with my top people. The only academic info debates that I could get with people are these lower atheists, and they're not academic debates. You get into a room with them, you try to organize an academic debate, and the next thing you know, they're accusing you of Nazis being a Nazi and all that, all all that stuff, and it, 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 it's just deplorable, really. Um, and so uh, they cause controversies over silly childish issues. They just they just can't actually get in a room and have a proper, old-fashioned, no holds barred, plain simple academic debate. They've always got to snigger and laugh and mock and all the rest of it. And it's a shame. It's a shame because they're impeding, they're holding back academic research. They're holding the atheist on the internet, especially. They're holding back the intellectual climate of the West. They're clogging up the system. They're spoiling dialogue and discussion and debate on the internet because they are anti-intellectual. These atheists. And the same goes for the evolutionist. Actually, the evolutionists are anti-intellectual. They're actually stopping the progress of science. They're if we got rid of evolution and we embraced intelligent design, 
science would absolutely flourish like it's it would be a new renaissance of science but evolution is holding back science and, and regressing science back to the dark ages in fact uh, it's holding back science for at least 150 years but if we got rid of evolution you would see an absolute absolute um, flourishing of science and the the many inventions the many um, discoveries of of drugs and the discovery of uh, new information that we would have if we dropped evolution and embraced intelligent design we would have a, a, a massive influx of new information and we would be able to bring a lot more healing to people we would discover the power how to heal uh, many of the big diseases today but evolution has been stopping this progressive development uh, and it, it's clogging up the, the system so it's important to save people's lives from many of the big diseases today to get rid of evolution and allow proper scientific study and inquiry it's really really sad that the evolutionarists are stopping proper academic development they are impeding proper scientific information we would have so many uh, new drugs new engineering uh, capabilities um, we would have so much that we could use uh, to help fight against diseases and famine and all the rest of it and it's shocking what the evolutionists have done and are doing now and it's time we brought an end to evolution and we uh, we began to build new technologies from uh, the development of information design that's where we need to be going today everybody knows this but very few scientists and academics want to say it but many of you actually feel this in your heart know it in your mind but are afraid to say it evolution could not do this the Mali bird lives in the Australian desert in May or June with his claws and the male makes a pit in the sand that is just the right size about three feet nine d dm deep and six feet eighteen dm long then he fills it with vegetation as it rots it eats up the bird waits patiently until the rains which increase the heat to over 100 Fahrenheit 38 Celsius at the bottom of the pile the bird waits until it's down 92 percent Fahrenheit and when the right temperature is reached he calls for his wife they mate she lays one egg a day for 30 days and then leaves the male then covers the eggs with sand and continually checks the temperature with amazing thermometer bill for seven weeks he cannot let the temperature go up or down even one degree of it if it cools at night he piles on more sand if it overheats in the dead pulls off sand at hatching time the chicks break their shells and crawl up through as much as two feet of sand arriving at the top each one is fully able to fly and is on its own neither father or mother Mali bird gives it any further attention or training when it grows up it does as its parents did so that's uh, chapter one and we've reached page 69 we'll be going through uh, other chapters and um, so this will be a series of maybe 10 15 videos of an hour long uh, that we'll be doing now I'm going to be doing another video which will be on historical studies so uh, stay tuned if you want to continue to join me uh, we have finished this uh, video and I'll be doing another video on this maybe tomorrow in the next few weeks on evolution and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it I'm now going to be doing a video on a historical study um, so I'll see you in a few minutes if you're interested uh, and if you're not don't worry about it so take care and God bless you
and see you soon.